welcome everybody um, to the uh, MPCCC Precision Oncology um, seminar today. I'm um, standing in for Mark Shackleton, who unfortunately can't make it this afternoon. Um, but uh, today we've got a, um, uh, the, the seminar is from uh, Sefi Rosenblur from the BDI. But before I introduce um, Sefi, before I introduce Sefi, I just want to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on, on which we gather today and respect, respectfully acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging, as well as any members of the Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander communities uh, gathered amongst us uh, this afternoon. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, the MPCCC Precision Oncology Programme uh, represents a community of researchers, health professionals and academics with an interest in uh, precision medicine, particularly as applies to oncology. And we're working together to enhance access to molecular sequencing for patients uh, across uh, Southeast Victoria. And the MPCCC uh, Precision Oncology Program also hosts several molecular tumor boards to um, aid interpretation and application of, of molecular data. Um, and if you need any more information about the activities of the Precision Oncology Program or those uh, MTBs, then uh, please contact Vicky, who, who can um, assist you in that regard. Um, before I introduce, give a bit more detail about Cephi, can I just remind you all to perhaps turn your videos off, but definitely mute, uh, mute your microphones uh, during the talk so we don't get any background uh, interference. So, um, so Cephi obtained his PhD from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem um, and then went on to uh, work at the Broad Institute at, at Harvard, where he was involved in some really kind of pioneering work uh, applying uh, functional genomics approaches to identifying uh, synthetic lethal uh, vulnerabilities in particular cancers and also and, and, and drivers of particular cancers um, as well. Uh, initially, particularly in the colorectal um, uh, space. And um, when I joined One Ash back in 2013, one of my goals as uh, head of biochem and also uh, joint head of the, of the BDI cancer program was to try and build expertise in functional genomics. And we set out a, a worldwide search for someone with that um, expertise. And we were kind of delighted to be able to recruit Safi, um, who joined us in late November uh, 2016. So he has his own um, functional genomics lab uh, in the department, but he also heads up our functional genomics platform um, uh, at, at Monash, which and both of those uh, initiatives are going, going ahead fantastically well and um, generating some really exciting data. So uh, without any more uh, to do, I'll just hand you over to Sefi, who's got some very interesting stories about his um, uh, application of functional genomics to enabling cancer precision medicine by identification of new drug targets and also risk alleles. So over to you, Sefi. Thank you, Roger, for that introduction. All right, so um, today I'm going to talk about functional genomics and um, oh, I can see a spelling error already here. Um, and um, I'll, I'll try and show you how we could use functional genomics to find new targets, um, new genes, and interesting insights um, about cancer. Um, and uh, we'll show some examples of how, how, how we do this. Um, the, the, the main goal of, of, of my lab, like um, many others here in, in, in the MPCCC, is to enable this idea of precision cancer therapy, which I don't really think needs a lot of introduction here. So we all know this idea that we want to take a patient population and use some sort of um, 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 molecular profiling. So that's either a mutation, um, copy number alteration, a pathology, gene expression signature, something that will classify patients and use that to develop a drug that will um, be specific and effective on those patients. Um, so we, we all know this approach, but what I want to emphasize and what you'll see a lot through my talk is that this approach to fire. So classifier, that would be that um, um, genomic alteration or that pathology or that um, um, whatever tumor feature you, you, you want to use. And then we need to find a target. So it's not enough to just have that um, um, molecular signature, but we need a target. We need something that we could um, um, inhibit or, or develop a drug against. Um, and this has been 
quite frankly, very challenging. And the reason for this is if you look at this cloud bubble, which has um, basically all the um, um, most frequently mutated cancer oncogenes, um, you could look at this and you could right away appreciate that you could find here kind of our known um, genes that we, uh, we always describe in these talks that have um, very good um, um, drugs against our BRAFs or um, EGFRs or PI3 kinates. Um, but you can kind of appreciate that those are a, a, just a tiny fraction of the actual cancer mutated oncogenes. And the reason that we can't develop a drug against, <clears throat> against, against one of these particular targets um, arises from two major reasons. The first major reasons are genes like um, KRAS or, 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 or beta catenin. So Keras and beta catenin, um, they're just not, not, not because of lack of trying, um, they just, uh, at least with our current methods, seems to be un undruggable. So despite um, um, many attempts by pharma and academia, nobody has really been able to develop really good inhibitors that target these genes and inhibit them. The other class of genes are genes that are lost in cancer. So those will be your P53s or APC. Um, Th those are a problem because those genes, um, how would you target something that is lost, that, that, that is uh, um, a loss of function? And I will talk here about different approaches that we could potentially use to target these loss um, of cancer mutated genes. Um, but th the whole idea and, and the whole idea of functional genomics is to go after these um, um, obscure targets that we can't really define um, 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 how to target them and use in vitro systems or, or cell culture systems in order to develop new approaches that target these genes. And here's how this basically works. What we first need to do is an analogous to what we would do in a patient population, is that we would have a, a population of patients. Here we have a population of cells, and these would typically be cultured cells. The next thing we need to do is we need to classify these cells. So. Um, just like we would do with the patients, we need to find a mutation that we're interested in, a you know, whatever feature that is also recapitulated um, in these um, um, particular cells. Then we could classify these as either to active or inactive. Active would be cells that have that mutation, and active would be cells that don't have that mutation. And what um, we would typically do is a genetic screen. Now we'll talk about different types of genetic screens. And in a genetic screen of this sort, we would um, survey many, many genes. And what we are looking for are genes that are specifically important in the context of that phenotype. So in this example here, you could see that gene one would killed both um, um, cells with the mutation or cells without the mutation. So these we call these um, common essential. These are genes that are essential for um, everything. Uh, but then we have a second class of genes. So these are genes that are important only in this context. So they are important only when you have um, this particular mutation. So when you have that mutation, these, so these are, would be good targets in the context of that mutations. And these are ones that we are interested in, we wanna find them um, and, and use them as targets for um, um, developing these approaches. Now, the main tool that um, um, we use in, in my lab and also in the platform are pooled genetic screens. Um, in the past, when you would do a genetic screen, you would basically need to have an arrayed format. So you need to have plates that um, each plate, each well in the plate would contain a different um, reagent to overexpress or suppress a gene and then um, measure phenotypes. Um, but um, with pooled genetic screens, we could do this much quicker, much faster, much cheaper in a much larger scale. And this is the idea of how this works. We first create um, a library of lentiviruses that have um, pooled um, um, ORFs, if you want to overexpress genes, or sgRNAs, and I'll show different types of sgRNAs um, um, to target genes. And we create this in one tube. So we have one tube that has these lentiviruses. Each virus contains a different reagent, so it perturbs a different gene. And then we infect this into a cell of interest. We do this at low um, MOI, multiplicity of infection. So we ensure we have only one reagent, one guide RNA per um, cell. The next thing we do is we apply a selection pressure. And this could be a drug. This could be simply um, 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 looking for proliferation. And what will happen is um, that these um, the, the, the distribution the um, 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 of these guide RNAs will differ depending on their role in this um, in the presence of this selection pressure. So in this example here, if we're looking at proliferation, what you could see is this um, brown cell. You had one of it, um, but now you have a lot of it. Right? And we would conclude that this brown cell, this guide RNA that targeted this um, in, in this brown cell was caused cells to grow faster as opposed to this 
um, um, orange cell which disappeared from the culture. And we would assume that this is a cell essential gene. So, so when you knock that gene down, this cell dies. And we um, quantify these by extracting genomic DNA and sequencing it. We use the sequencing in order to count the guide RNAs. Um, this is what it looks like, right? So this brown guide RNA is now overrepresented. So we think that this causes cells to grow faster. And this um, um, pink guide RNA disappeared. So we think that this is um, essential for the cell to survive. Um, so um, we, we could use many different technologies. And these are the basic, most of the technologies that we use um, um, in my lab, right, to um, um, study genes and how they function. And these could be either loss of function screens, um, gain of function screens, or um, screens looking at DNA modifications. And I'll try and talk a little bit about um, all of them. So um, our, I'd say the majority of, of what we're, we're typically doing is using loss of function screens. And loss of function screens, we have three different, sorry, three different um, approaches. So these could be either CRISPR knockouts, and that would be wild type Cas9 fused to a guide RNA that cuts, that um, targets um, um, a gene and, and knocks it out. We could use CRISPR inhibitory. Here we use DCAS9, it's called. So this is an inactive form of Cas9. It's called DCAS9. It could bind to DNA, but no longer cut DNA. And when we target this to transcription start sites, this would inhibit transcription um, um, without cutting DNA. And the last approach um, is called RNAi, uh, the probably oldest approach. And here we use the RNAi machinery to suppress the transcript, so the um, mRNA of a gene. Um, usually the problem with RNAi is it's off-targets effects, and uh, I will um, talk about some of these um, um, later. Um, the second approach we have is gain of function. So here we could use either CRISPR-A or CRISPR activation. So here we fuse the DCAS9 to VP64, and when we target this to transcription start site, we activate genes. And here we would ask questions in, questions like, what happens when you overexpress a gene? Um, how does that affect um, your phenotype? Or we could use um, ORF libraries. So these are libraries. Um, they're fixed libraries that contain ORFs. They induce very strong expression um, of target genes. And we could ask, what does that do um, to our phenotype of interest? And the last type that I will talk a little bit about at the end are um, our newer approaches um, to introduce DNA modifications. And these can be used in either base editors. So these are, again, DCAS9s fused to um, DNA modifying enzymes. And these could modify the bases of the DNA. Uh, we have two current base editors that we convert either a C to a T or an A to a G. Um, and we could ask, what are the phenotypes? So this would be more for looking at variants um, or introduction of different mutations and seeing what, what the consequence of that or CRISPR, what we call CRISPR-M for CRISPR methylation is a system that we have developed to induce DNA methylation and ask how that is affecting um, cancer phenotypes. Um, so in my um, um, original work that, that I've done at the Broad that, 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 that Roger mentioned, where we had the initial, uh, initial starting of these kind of screens was to do these in multiple cell lines and ask, could we find genes that are specific for a particular phenotype? And here's an example of what this looks like. So here you're seeing on the left here, this is a heat map of genes that are important for a specific cancer phenotype. So these are cancers that have activation of the Wnt signaling pathway. The Wnt signaling pathway is aberrant in many, many cancers, most noticeably in, in, in colon cancers. Um, and what each row here represents is a different gene. And each column represents a different cell line. And this is across 200 cell lines. And when we um, separate these cell lines by the status of the Wnt activity, you could see that we could find these genes on the left here that are important for proliferation only in the context when of activation of the Wnt signaling pathway. So when you have hyperactive Wnt signaling, these are essential as opposed to these other cells. Of course, we could find many known um, components of the Wnt signaling pathway, um, but we were able to find new um, and, and, and interesting insights. And one of the most significant ones was this um, protein called YAP1, a transcription factor that was important um, and, and activated transcription. And now this is much more well studied and understood that this YAP is important in this context of these beta-catenin-driven um, cancers. 
Um, now there's, um, ever since um, we've done this now a couple of years ago, um, um, there's now a publicly available database with all of these um, type of um, genome-wide, um, this was done with, with, with shRNAs, but now with CRISPR screens. And you could actually uh, very highly recommend this, um, 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 the depth map, the um, link is down here. Um, you could go into it. It's a very easy to use interface. Um, you could look at your um, phenotype of interest, gene of interest, and it'll um, um, show you genes that are important um, for your phenotype, and you could correlate with different molecular features that you're interested in. And it's a really nice way to get hypotheses um, um, that are related to your phenotype. There's a lot of data there that's you know, waiting to be mined. Um, so we could, another type of, uh, um, of approach that um, we have used, and um, this is using now gain of function screens. So this is the opposite. So instead of suppressing genes, here we want to activate genes. And in this example here, we used um, a KRAS mutant line. So this is a line that has a KRAS mutation and is sensitive to KRAS inhibition. And um, um, we introduced a genome-wide um, um, ORF library here. So we overexpress genes. Um, and then we induce a KRAS shRNA. So when the KRAS shRNA is induced, all these cells should die unless they contain an ORF that um, rescues this KRAS phenotype. And when we do that, this is how this looks like. We again found here, yeah, one. Um, and, and now this is already, it's been a while ago now, and this is now very well documented that YAP1 is important for both beta catenin and the um, um, MAP kinase RAS signaling pathway. Um, and now there's quite a few drug companies that are trying to develop um, um, inhibitors um, against this. Um, but today I want to focus more on um, um, a different type of vulnerability, one that's associated not with um, I am this two-class comparison, but one that is associated with these type of genomic alterations that we really are struggling in um, um, targeting. And we really struggle in targeting them because we just don't know how to target genomic loss. So it's very easy to envision how you would target gain or a gain of mutation if you have a drug that inhibits that particular mutation. But it's much harder to envision how would you target a gene that is lost in cancer. And the reason that this is so important is that um, one of the things that um, I don't think is, is, is enough appreciated is that the most common event that happens in cancer is actually not mutations. The most common cancer event that happens is loss of DNA. So if you look at this plot here, you can look at the fraction of geno genome loss, the fraction of the geno genome that is lost in a cancer um, in, in different samples. And this is using TCGA data. And what you could see that 50% of cancers have at least 10% of their whole genome lost. And uh, it's a pretty striking number if you think about it. So 10% of the entire DNA sequence is just gone, not there anymore. Still, these cancers are functioning and um, obviously growing, um, but they have lost a significant chunk of their DNA. And one thought at first, you would think, you know, maybe it's not so important to lose your chunk of your DNA. Maybe you could just lose this DNA, but nothing really actually happens in the cell. But when we correlate this genomic loss, this, this, this number of DNA to um, gene expression, what you could see is this, and this is both for either for TCGA, which is um, tumors, or CCLE, which is cell lines, and you can see this bimodal distribution. Um, so you have about half of the genes are very highly correlated, it means that about half of the genes, um, once you lose that chunk of DNA, you also lose expression, and for um, about another half of the gene, they are not correlated. Um, and, and what this suggests is that there is actual uh, a functional loss of DNA and gene expression. And the question is, could we actually use this? Could we actually use this phenomena of loss of DNA to develop new drugs? And th this is the basic idea, which is called um, a cyclops. And this is how this idea um, um, works. So here is a depiction of a chromosome. Um, which in normal cells um, you have two copies of. Um, and in this particular chromosome has a, um, um, on its side, a tumor suppressor gene. Um, the cancer uh, wants to lose that tumor suppressor gene because it wants to grow faster. And what it'll typically do, it'll basically lose this whole arm, this whole piece of DNA that contains 
this tumor suppressor gene. It doesn't know how to only lose this very small region containing the tumor suppressor gene. It loses a whole big chunk of DNA. Now, in the process of losing this whole big chunk of DNA, there are genes that are just nearby this tumor suppressor gene. They have nothing to do with its activity. They have nothing to do. They're not related to it. They just happen to be neighbors. And because they are neighbors to this tumor suppressor gene, these cell essential genes are also lost in cancer. So now what you have is this um, phenomenon that in the cancer, the cancer is growing faster because it does not have the tumor suppressor gene, but the cancer has also lost DNA or one copy of DNA encoding the cell essential gene. It could still survive because it has a second copy, but it has less of it. So that would cause reduced mRNA levels in the cancer cell. So if you would look at the cell essential gene, now the cancer cell has only half the amount of the mRNA. It could still survive with half the amount of mRNA, but we have a window here. And the, the basic idea is that we, if we use um, um, RNAi or use um, drugs that inhibit this, um, um, this residual um, 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 mRNA expression, um, it, 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 um, you'll, you'll be left in the wild type with still enough to survive, but in the cancer cell, that would lead to death. And the hypothesis is that this window here could lead to potentially a way to target these loss of DNA in cancer. And um, the, the reason we call this Cyclops, another way to look at this is because um, Cyclops, if you know about Cyclops, is a kind of monster that has one eye. And um, if you think about this monster, this cancer that has only one eye because one has been deleted and you have the good guy that has two eyes, if you take out one eye from each, the good guy could still um, survive because he has one eye, but the cancer can now is completely blind because um, we, we took out his eye. And um, the, the cyclops that I'm going to talk about um, 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 is related to the wind signaling pathway. Um, and just this is the, just a, 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 a brief overview of the wind signaling pathway. Um, the wind signaling pathway is highly important in cancer. The whole idea of this pathway is to regulate this transcription factor called beta catenin. And it, it has two states, an off state and an off and an on state. In the off state, there's a complex called the destruction complex. It binds to beta catenin and destroys it. But then when it goes to the on state, um, this destruction complex becomes inactive. Um, beta catenin becomes stabilized, goes into the nucleus and activates target genes. What happens in many cancers, and again, most noticeably in, in colon cancers, um, the components of this um, destruction complex are mutated. Um, and, and APC is the most common one. And when they are mutated, now there's nothing to destroy beta catenin and it just continuously goes into the nucleus, activates target genes and results in um, hyperproliferation um, of the cancer. Now, what we know is that APC um, um, could be um, destroyed either by mutations or in a, at least 20% of colon cancers by loss of one APC allele. Um, so to look for cyclops that are related to these phenotypes, we started to look at, um, at, at cyclops in, in colon cancers. And we do this by looking at a correlation between the dependency. So how is this gene, uh, what, what is the dependency score of this gene and the copy number? Or the correlation between dependency and expression. Genes that score up here would be our typical cyclops. So these would be genes that when you have low copy of, they are essential for survival. Genes that score down here would be the opposite. So these would be your typical oncogenes. So um, um, MIC, um, EGFR, and so on, right? So these are genes when they are overexpressed, the cells are dependent on them. And one of our top genes that scores here is this gene here called SRP19. We also see the same phenomena when we look at whole genome um, um, cyclop analysis, which SRP19, again, this gene here, which is very close to APC, which scores as a um, cyclop gene. Now, um, one important um, thing that um, um, I didn't mention before is that what we know about cyclops, what's interesting about them is that they only score when we use RNAi. So when we use CRISPRs, actually cyclops don't score at all. 
And the reason for that, and this is so this is what you're seeing here. Here you're looking at beta catenin active or inactive cells. When we look at these kind of dependencies that we have found before, like beta catenin or GAP1, or dependencies that are related to um, um, beta catenin activity, um, we see a very nice um, 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 separation between these two states um, um, and, and using CRISPR as well as RNAi. But when we look at these cyclops, so here on the bottom here, so these score very nicely with RNAi. But when we look at CRISPRs, these, these basically all look like right here, like these on the top here, like cell essential genes. So the cyclops and the cell essential genes look um, identical. And the reason that we think this is happening is because um, CRISPRs work on the DNA, not on the RNA. The RNA is much more dynamic. So it's much harder to deplete all of the RNA. And um, shRNAs deplete usually some of it. They don't deplete it completely. As opposed to CRISPRs, when they work on the DNA and when they actually work, they complete, they, 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 they have a 100% um, um, effect. Um, and um, um, so that's maybe one advantage is why you actually sometimes want to use RNAi, because um, even though it does have off-target effects, the RNAi dampens the expression, which um, gives us this new type of targets that we could not identify if we would only use um, CRISPRs. Um, all of the cyclops that we find um, um, using this approach are um, obviously cell um, um, genes that are important for cell essential processes. So these are genes that are essential for things like um, um, the Golgi R, um, proteasome, um, replication, transcription. Um, and again, the idea here is that we're going to use a window. So um, these genes are essential for everything, but if we find the correct window, they might be more essential um, for the cancer. So looking at the genomics of it, this is what um, SRP19 and APC look like. So here on, on the left here, you see that APC and SRP19, these two genes are very close to each other, just 15 kilobases um, apart. And not surprisingly, if you look at the copy number alterations, and this is from the TCGA, so across um, um, I think this is about 4,000 patients, um, whenever APC is deleted, also SRP19 is deleted. So it's almost never the case that you have only one of them deleted and not the other, just because they're so close together. Same thing we see with gene expression. If we look at the expression in, in, in cancer patients, when we have loss of SRP19, um, this is um, correlated with lower expression of SRP19, again, suggesting that this, is a, a, this would be a good sock club. Um, what does SRP19 do? So SRP19 is part of a complex called the signal recognition particle. Now, the signal recognition particle is a um, um, complex that's important for identifying proteins as they are um, budding out of the ribosome and directing them towards the ER. Um, once the signal recognition um, um, identifies a specific um, signal on these proteins, it directs it to the ER, where uh, um, the proteins go to the ER, and then they could be secreted um, from the cell. And that's why this is important for every cell um, to survive. Um, this is the complex. This is what we know about the um, 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 signal recognition particle. It's composed of four different proteins and a non-coding RNA, um, which are all 100% essential for every cell um, to survive. So next we looked, could we recapitulate this phenotype in a cell? So the first thing is looking at SRP19 expression and looking here at cells with two copies, so normal expression of um, um, SRP or cells that have loss of SRP. And uh, we could recapitulate the phenotype so we see lower, lower RNA levels, which also is accompanied by lower protein levels, SRP19 protein levels um, in these um, um, SRP19 loss cell line. So again, loss of APC and SRP um, leads to less expression of SRP19. This is not always the case for, for every one of these cyclops, but for this cyclop, it seems to be very much the case. We next um, wanted to see if we could recapitulate the um, um, killing phenotype. And here we're using siRNAs. And the reason we use siRNAs is because they are very tunable. And what you can see here is when we take these loss cell lines, they are very sensitive to siRNAs that inhibit SRP19. And pretty low concentrations, they pretty much collapse, as opposed to the neutral cells in which we go very high um, with our siRNAs, and despite very good knockdown of the gene, um, it's, 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 we see a very, very big window 
which is um, in the size of the window or the difference that we see is, is pretty similar to what we would see with a typical um, oncogene, a typical KRAS um, 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 siRNA, for example, in a KRAS mutated, mutated line. Um, now, of course, as I told you, with siRNAs, we always have to be careful because we know that siRNAs are very prone to off-target effects. And the first thing we did to confirm that this is not due to an off-target effect, and I'm, I'm just showing you the ones that worked because we've had a lot of SIs that did not work, um, is to overexpress um, SRP19 and show that the overexpression rescues the proliferation phenotype. And we see that for these two um, um, siRNAs. The second thing we did is another control, which we call C911. But this is also a very important control in which we um, take, take three of the nucleotides within SRP19 and convert them. So we convert these phenotypes to um, 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 revert their sequences. And what happens is that that, that, that new um, 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 C911 control loses its ability to um, inhibit the gene but still um, retains the off-target effect of the siRNA. And when we do that, um, we could see that actually we reverted the um, suppression phenotype. So, um, so again, now, um, so we could still inhibit SRP19, but we can no longer with the C911 inhibit SRP19 expression. And more importantly, we could revert the um, proliferation phenotype. So indicating that these are um, specific um, siRNAs. Um, so so that, that, was, that got us excited. Um, but then what, what got us really excited is when we started looking at um, um, the dependency maps at, at, at um, siRNA screens and large scale siRNA screens and looking at other components of the signal recognition particle. And what we find is that the SRP19 dependency, and this is across 500 cell lines, so we look at the SRP19 dependency score here on the x-axis and other components of the signal recognition particle, they're all very, very well correlated. So these numbers here are, are very rarely seen for a correlation in these kind of data sets. Usually like, um, like high correlations are considered 0.1 something, right? So these are very, very strong correlations, um, suggesting that that loss of SRP19 would also cause dependency on the other phenotype and the other components of this complex. Um, and to test this, what we did was to take one of these components, SRP54, um, and we looked at our um, 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 SRP19 loss and non-loss cells. And again, we see this differential phenotype is that when um, you lose, when cells are sensitive for SRP19, they're also very sensitive to loss of other components um, of this complex. And this is important because this suggests that SRP19 at least is a limiting um, factor. And what we think is that um, um, this complex requires a complete intact complex in order to be active. And once you lose one of the components of the complex, um, all the rest, which are basically free proteins, they just get depleted um, from the cell. So they're not depleted of the cell because the, their DNA sequence is depleted, but because the protein is basically left alone. And to confirm this, we started looking, we looked at SRP54 stability in um, neutral or APC loss cell lines. And despite the fact that we don't see any difference in mRNA, which you would expect because the mRNA of these um, of SRP54 should not be different in SRP19 loss cell lines, we see a very dramatic loss of um, SRP54 mRNA in, in these um, APC loss um, um, cell lines. And to further confirm this, we used um, um, SRP54 um, um, siRNAs. And you see that when you delete SRP54, SRP19 goes down to mRNA, uh, uh, protein, sorry. And, and this um, um, is an indication that this whole complex is important in this context of SRP19 um, deletion. And what we are doing now is developing um, um, methods and, um, um, that are ongoing to, to try and inhibit the SRP complex, because um, this suggests just that when we have loss of SRP19, which happens in 20% of, of, of colon cancers, you will be very sensitive to SRP19, to SRP complex inhibitors, which are, um, some of them are available and some of them we are trying to um, develop. So to summarize this part, I showed you um, a way in which we could target um, um, loss of DNA in tumors. And I showed you SRP19 as a 
gene that is lost in combination with APC. Um, and that leads to um, destabilization of the whole SRP complex and suggests that um, if we use inhibitors of SRP19 complex or protein folding, which would be also important for the SRP complex, we could potentially find inhibitors that would be very specific to this type of genomic alteration. Now, the second story I want to tell you looks at um, um, a different um, type of um, alterations, and these come from GWAS screens. So the, um, um, uh, I'm sure you're all aware of the idea of GWAS, which is to identify variants that are associated with cancer risk. And this is important because when we identify new variants that are associated with cancer risk, you could um, develop you know, better monitoring strategies and better ways um, um, to, to, to look at cancer. Um, and if you basically look at the, um, at the landscape of, um, in this case, breast cancer risk, we have three types of um, genomic variants. So the first type um, are here on the top. These are rare variants that are correlated with very high cancer risk. And these include are your BRCA1s, your BRCA2s, P53s. So these are not very common in the population, but um, individuals that carry those variations are very highly likely um, to um, um, have breast cancer. Um, similarly, we have these intermediate risks, which um, give a very strong um, um, risk. These are these would be the high, the rare and the intermediate risk variants would be the ones um, that um, um, you would use to identify women that are at high risk of developing cancers. But then we have these um, genes here on the bottom. So these um, risk variants that are associated with low risk, they still have a very significant and a very um, good p-value, so they're very much associated with risk, but they are pretty common in the population. Um, and if you look at these genes, a lot of these are uh, the genes that are in here, a lot of these show our, 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 our well-known cancer genes, but still they are um, um, showing, they are, they are common. So, so you would not want to use these as, um, as, as predictors, as, as a way to assess women with high risk, um, but they are still extremely useful. And the reason that they are very useful is that we know from other GWAS studies, from other diseases, is that if you are able to develop a drug that targets a GWAS target, so a gene with genetic evidence, you are at least three times more likely um, to become an approved therapy. So um, most drugs that we know that target just that came out of screens or, or typical screens that work well in vitro, um, a lot of the times will not translate to a drug that works in humans. Um, but um, all of what we have for, for GWAS studies, and, and this is the, one of the main motivations for, for GWAS studies, is that even these low, these common variants, um, if you are able to find the genes that are associated with them, you are very likely um, to develop a drug that will work in humans. Now, the main problem with most of these variants that I showed you, these, low, these common variants in breast cancer, is that they are pretty much all of them located in enhancers. And that means that uh, they are not actually in a target gene. And we actually don't know what are the genes that they are targeting. So we have no idea how to go from a variant to a gene. So, we, we, so, so basically, from what we have right now, we, we, there, there's no possibility of taking these variants and developing drugs against them and testing them to see what they are doing and how they are actually important. So this is the basic idea of what, of, of, of what the whole premise of, um, of GWAS is and um, um, a ton of money that has been put in, in doing this in very large populations, right? Because um, um, the, the, the rare variants we could find even in, in, in small populations, but the common variants are very hard to find and we need to use very large screens. So hundreds of thousands of women, right? Um, and the, 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 the premise of this is to identify these hits um, then we identify genes that are correlated with these hits, and then we could develop drugs that target those genes. Um, and this has been done, obviously, for other diseases, but for cancer, um, um, especially due to the fact that pretty much all these are targeting are, are these variants are enhancers, we don't know how to do this. So here's a project that we developed, and this is in, in, in a very close collaboration with um, Georgia Shanovix Trench from um, QIMR in Brisbane. Um, so we took these um, breast cancer risk loci and we developed an algorithm called Inquisit that will um, 
predict um, with a degree of likelihood which one of these um, um, genes that are in close proximity to these enhancer variants are um, would be associated with the variants, would be um, 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 regulated by these variants. Um, and then we develop a library, and we develop three different libraries. So libraries for either knockout, libraries for either CRISPR inhibitory, or rather for CRISPR activation. And we put this in six different um, immortalized memory cell lines, and we look at different phenotypes. And I'll show you these different phenotypes. So looking at how these genes, when you knock them or overexpress them, how they affect proliferation, um, um, DNA repair, um, and, uh, and, and um, 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 tumors in, in, in animals. And um, uh, I won't talk about um, antigen presentation and other essays that, that we are doing with these now. And the, again, the basic idea is that once we find these genes, these would be prime candidates for um, developing of new drugs. So uh, I'll start with showing you some of our results from this. Um, so this is our um, um, proliferation screens. So we chose um, 608 genes that scored um, in, 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 in Inquisit 1. So they scored as, um, 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 so, uh, sorry, 108 genes that scored, uh, 137 genes that, that, that scored by Inquisit 1 to be correlated to these and other types of genes that scored. And we use these in, uh, to, do, to look at proliferation. So we put them into cells and we measure what happens to the sgRNA abundance in two-dimensional um, um, cultures or three-dimensional cultures. This is an example of what this looks like. So here are two-dimensional cultures and we're looking for genes that when you knock them down, increase um, um, proliferation. Right, so these would be um, we would consider these as um, new novel right tumor suppressor genes. Um, what we found it was that it was very um, gratifying to do these in different types of assays because um, we have found that some of the assays were better in finding um, one type of genes and other assays are better at finding other types of genes. Um, so here's the correlations between them. In general, they do agree with each other, but not always. And here's an example for one of the genes here, CFL1, that only scores. So if you do just a two-dimensional culture, this gene actually doesn't score at all. It doesn't look like at all it's doing anything. But in three dimensionals, it has a very strong um, phenotype. And um, the reason that we think that is, is because CFL is probably related to migration. So it's related to... Um, 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 regulation of the cytoskeleton network, and that is probably why it's important only in three dimensional and then two dimensions. Um, and this kind of emphasizes why we need to do this in multiple cell lines and with multiple um, different assay systems. And here is our total um, summary of all of our results um, in our, our proliferation assays in two dimensional, three dimensional. Um, so we're again, this is six cell lines, and we have different hits, different genes that score differently. Um, what you could appreciate here is our control genes, um, pretty much the majority of them scored very strongly, as you would expect. Um, our, um, for most, what, what, what was kind of surprising to me is that when we looked at most of the known scoring methods that are available um, um, out there, um, been used quite, quite often, they seem to be um, pretty much as good as background. So um, um, these are background genes, so this is random genes, so you still will find genes that are important for proliferation. But when we look at different scoring methods, so you known scoring methods, they we get about two to three percent, right? Similar to background. Inquisit one, um, 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 the, the algorithm that Juno from um, George's lab developed was very good and scored almost um, double um, um, better than, than background which was a very nice way to show that this is a very valid um, methodology. Um, but um, more importantly, we have here a lot of genes that we identified that are important for, that are correlated to a variant. So these are genes that are regulated by a cancer variant and are driving a cancer um, phenotype. These include well-known genes like um, MAKE or um, NF1, um, but we have a lot of genes here that um, are very understudied or not studied at all, like ftf 7 ip a toxin 7 um, and, and, and others. Um, so these are the first essays that we looked at, which is um, um, proliferation. The second uh, um, essay that we looked at is in vivo um, screens. 
So here, what we do is we infect our cells, so um, our, with the, with our lantiviral um, library, and then we inject them into mice. We wait for the tumors to grow. We extract the tumors. We sequence them, and we look at the guide RNAs that are present in that tumor. And this is what it looks like. We obviously get a lot less hits, um, not as much as we got. Um, but what was um, cool for us to see is that we found some hits that were unique, that only scored in vivo, but um, did not score at all in, in vitro. And one of them here is this gene here, DUSP4. When we knock it down in, in, in our 2D and 3D cultures, they didn't do, didn't do anything. But when we knock them down in vivo, they had a very dramatic um, phenotype. And uh, we're now looking at how exactly this, this works. And we can validate these um, using um, um, xenograft um, um, assays. Running out of time, I'll try and go fast. Um, so um, the last essay we used is looking at DNA damage. So DNA damage screen, the way this works is we're looking at a synthetic lethal um, interaction. Here's the basic idea. If you take a cell that has a um, that is deficient in a component of the DNA damage repair, um, these cells become sensitive to elaborate, right? A, a, a inhibitor of the um, DNA um, excision repair. So here's an example. When you knock down BRCA1, um, these cells are very sensitive to elaborate. So this is what we do in the screen. We infect with the lentiviral library, and then we either treat cells with elaborate and DMSO, and we look for genes that are deleted only in the presence of elaborate, which would indicate that these are important for the DNA damage repair. And when we do that, um, this is a very successful screen because we could um, basically recapitulate the entire DNA damage repair pathway. So we find almost all known DNA damage repair genes, um, which was nice. And we actually identified some new genes, so genes that um, um, we never knew before that are important for the DNA damage repair. Um, if we look at the actual gene set enrichment analysis, we find that they're all related to DNA damage repair. And we could validate these. So genes like CIVA1 and CMTR2, not really known to have any role in DNA damage, we find that they are very important um, for this pathway. Um, we could validate these findings. So, uh, so again, here's one, one validation of this using HiC, showing this connection between ATF7IP, one of our um, um, novel genes that we found to be important um, um, for driving these cancer phenotype. And we see this chromatin interaction between ATF7IP promoter and a um, variant, um, which um, that's why this is important, because now we know that this variant interacts with this promoter to drive the exp low expression of ATF7IP, which drives the cancer proliferation phenotype. And, and, and now we are working on getting this um, for um, all of the genes we have with um, a few different methodologies. So we can make that strong connection between a variant, a gene expression, and a phenotype. Um, now, the last thing I want to show you is, I think, one of the coolest things we have, which is a um, new approach of how to look at mechanism. So we have now a, a pretty large list of um, um, genes that are, that are driving breast cancer phenotypes. But of course, the question is, how are they doing that, right? What are their mechanisms of actions? And we could, of course, go through the typical route of taking each one of these and starting to do 100 different assays and, and asking what they are doing. And we're doing for some of them these. Um, but um, what we wanted to develop is a more high throughput method to do this. And what we are using is a method called CropSeq. And what we do in CropSeq is a basically a way to um, get um, very quickly and very robustly um, um, gene expression profiles. And the way this works is that we have a vector um, that um, encodes two different um, um, transcripts. And, and you can see here that it has a U6 promoter as well as an E1F alpha promoter, so a Pol3 um, um, promoter and a Pol2 promoter. And this will generate two types of transcripts. One type of transcript is these functional, so this is a typical guide RNA that you would use in normal typical CRISPR screens, but we also generate this poly-A barcoded um, um, mRNA transcript. And this is used for detection of the mRNA. And how this works is we create a library of these, which we put it into cells, and then we use single cell RNA-seq um, to um, sort these cells into individual cells and then profile the complete mRNA in the cell. And what we get out of this is the sgRNA identity because of this transcript here. So we know what sgRNA was in the cell, and we could see the gene expression changes. And um, we have done this. I'm not going to go through all the quality control, and this works um, very well. We could see uh, we could see um, a knockdown of genes, and we could see expected um, gene signatures. Um, so this method works very nicely. 
Uh, but what's more importantly is that when we look, when we use this method to um, look at correlation between genes, so this is a heat map looking at how different genes are correlating, and we're using RNA sequencing as our metrics to um, look at the connections between genes. And this data set includes known genes as well as um, a lot of our, in green here, all the genes that are scored in our um, um, GWAS screen. And um, what you could see is that very well-known genes here, like the um, pietrokinase signaling pathway, um, 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 the HIPPO pathway, um, swipe sniff. So, so these are known to interact with each other. The, everything falls where they're supposed to be. So um, APC and um, 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 kinase one fall in one place and beta catenin falls in another place. So everything fits and falls to where you would expect it to fall, which is which is very nice and cool to show that. And we and this generates new hypotheses. So for example, this shows here that ATF7IP, which we there's basically you know three papers in the literature about ATF7IP, um, um, shows that it's scoring together with this PI3 kinase, suggesting that it has a role in regulating this PI3 kinase um, pathway somehow. And 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 now um, I won't go into all the data we have of this, uh, but looking at um, this is a way to now connect between these variants, genes, and pathways. And now, um, um, so to summarize this, I showed you some um, high throughput ways to identify genes. And now we could identify the genes, the phenotypes they drive, and the next stage will be to identify drugs that target these um, pathways and genes. Um, last technology that I will show you today is the newest um, kin on the block, which are base editors, which are very exciting. So base editors are um, a new type of approach to introduce mutations. So now instead of just introducing, just knocking down the gene, we could actually in introduce these variants and ask what is happening um, to the cell lines. And um, up here is to show you that these work very well. So we have two types of base editors, CBEs and ABEs, to convert a C to a T or an A to a G. And um, when we use them in our initial experiments, um, they show very good conversion. So here you're seeing that these three Cs are converted to a, a to a T. And not only could we convert them, but we could actually get, get expression phenotypes. So when we convert this um, um, C to a T in this enhancer, so this is not a gene, it's an enhancer of cyclin D1, we see upregulation of cyclin D1. And as, um, as you would expect um, um, to see, because that's what's known about this enhancer. And we see the opposite when we, this other um, um, enhancer of BCL11A. Um, so that's very exciting, and that's where um, we really are aiming to going, um, providing us another way to prove and, and to, to, to strengthen this connection between a variant, a phenotype, and eventually um, a drug. Um, so with that, a bit over time, um, I will finish and um, just um, acknowledge a lot of people that are involved. I just talked about some of the projects we have in the lab. Our lab has a lot of other projects um, using functional genomics to identify different kinds of dependencies. Um, I mentioned this, um, our breast cancer is a very strong collaboration with um, uh, George Yashinovic's Trench from QIMR. Um, on the bottom here are my funding agencies. And so I don't forget, I promised Roger that I would also um, advertise the cell signaling um, conference that is happening on um, the 21st of May. There's still room to register to it. Um, it's going to be online. So I, I very highly recommend everybody register to this. It'll be very good. A lot of cool speakers. Um, and that is it. And I will take questions. Awesome. Thank you very much, Sefi. A fantastic talk. Um, yeah, so any questions um, from, from, the, from the audience? If I just kind of quickly, uh, on my own screen, pull up the, uh, so if, can you stick your hand up if you've got a question? I might just start off, um, got a couple of questions. I'll just start off by, by asking you, Safi. Um, so with the, the work you're doing on the, um, the SRP complex, so that, that was the, you know, the first part of the talk. Can you just elaborate a bit more about what inhibitors are available um, for that complex? And also you mentioned inhibitors of protein folding. So, so would that be the um, HSP90 inhibitors? So, so we're looking at both HSP90 inhibitors. So we're looking at a lot of different inhibitors. The, 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 um, the, the problem that we have with those that are, those are all indirect. So those would affect the activity of the SRP complex. And we see some activity of those, right? But they won't directly affect the SRP complex. 
we are trying to now develop different ways to directly inhibit the SRP complex, which I think will be much more effective. Hmm. So we could, so the SRP complex is important for direction of proteins to the ER. So if you would cause protein stress, you would affect that, that complex, but those are all indirect. Sure. And okay. we'd, we'd much, I think that one of the things, we, we don't know that for sure yet, but I think that that it really will require a direct inhibitor, um, which is possible because there's a lot of options here because you could both inhibit the, um, 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 the, the non-coding RNA. Um, you, there's a lot of options to inhibit here. Sure. Okay. So do we have any uh, questions from the other participants? I'm scanning, scanning the list vociferously. Um, the second question I had pertained to your screen and um, I feel bad about suggesting another assay um, and also I don't want to delay you submitting your paper on this any longer. <laughs> 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 but um, I was just interested, I mean, I was interested about in the fact that you'd, you had some hits where you were only seeing an effect in the animal model. Mm -hmm. And then that took me, that kind of led me to, to wonder about, that, was, that wasn't a syngenetic model, was it? No. No, so I was kind of wondering whether you'd, you'd considered, you know, using like the 41 model and, and just seeing whether there were hits which you only picked up when you went into a syngenetic. Because, I mean, presumably, you know, there may well be hits which are related to, to, in, to immune surveillance. So that's a very good question. So we have, we have actually a completely different experiment that we're, that we're, that, that we're engaged in and like um, in trying to find if any of these hits are important for immune surveillance. So we have a whole essay, an immune surveillance essay, and we're like directly testing that if it's important for immune surveillance. We do think that the, the gene, the DUST4 that showed up, um, we, we are looking to see if that is somehow regulating some immune modulators, right? Yeah. Because that would be, that, that would suggest that. Um, but we are looking at that. We don't, I don't know, we don't have an answer. Sure. All right, thank you very much, Sefi, and everyone have a great weekend.